recording now. Record it. So we stop. Um, so welcome. Welcome to the CMS uh, site. Uh, sorry for the uh, the change. We got, well, there was a misunderstanding for the for the uh, link uh, to the Zoom link. So, but now we, this is a webinar, um, and uh, Mick will start uh, with or continue with his introduction, and then I will take take over and uh, and and uh, show you and make the visit. So I would I, I will, while while we uh, do the visit or while we have the presentation, I, I would like to ask you to any question, just type in in the Q and A, in, in the Q and A, in the Q and A, and not the chat, not in the chat, in the Q and Q and A, and like and like this, uh, Mick will then ask or answer the uh, the question immediately, or ask me, and then I can show more detailed. Uh, you can guide me uh, to more uh, elements in the experimental coverage. Okay, great. Okay, Michael, I think we've done the introductions because we've lost quite a lot of time now. So I think we should just uh, start. They know where you are. You're at the CMS experiment, the far side of the ring. I'm sitting on top of the Alice experiment. So let's go. Okay, let's go. Okay, Klaus is going to sit here. Let, why don't we introduce him? Well, well, well maybe let, you connect this. No. Hello, uh, just, just one good, uh, what good, good point, of course. Noemi, can you come for a moment? Uh, just to, I want just to introduce you, uh, the, the team here at, at, at CMS. So technical team, you have here Sultan and, and Noemi and, uh, you, uh, and uh, Klaus, Klaus uh, from Germany. And we have uh, two, two more trainees who will, will join us. Yeah. And Klaus is going to take you over when, when oh, it's, you are it's lost. Mick, it's Mick. When you are lost. Mick, Mick, Mick is Mick is doing this. He's chairing this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Uh, I'll I'll just connect to them. Good. Okay. So while Michael is preparing to go down and show you all the interesting pieces. I'm Actually, just, Mickey, you could go around in the control room, don't you? So I'm just taking over here in case some interruption or whatever happens. So whenever there's a boring silence or so, I'm trying to jump in and explain you some interesting things. Or in case I see one of the questions in the Q&A, I can try to answer as well if as far as I as far as possible. So as soon as they are ready. Klaus, what, Klaus, Klaus yes. what's, your, what's your job? Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, in the hectic, I didn't introduce me. So my name is Klaus Rabatz. I am a scientist at the University of Karlsruhe. And uh, I'm currently here at CERN. I'm doing also what our colleague Haifa is doing, shift leader that I'm doing from time to time. And just now, I happen to be available to help you with the virtual visit. Normally, I'm doing QCD analysis at LHC. QCD, what's that? Um, quantum chromodynamics. So that is a particular topic when we are looking into events of the experiment. Sometimes or very frequently, you will see that there's not one particle coming out of such a particle collision, but a large shower of them. And these particle showers, which are composed of many ingredients, these are combined into something uh, that is named jets. So like a jet d'eau, something moving with the same velocity in the same direction. And these jets are interesting uh, information that can give us information about the nuclear structure of the particles that we are colliding, protons, for example. Okay, so you're, and you're sitting in the, uh, the control room. This is where uh, the whole experiment is, is controlled from. This uh, 21 meters long and 15 meters in diameter, a immense structure that we're going to look at below ground. Um, how many people does it take to look after that machine at three o'clock in the morning on a Sunday when it's actually running? So that's about five people. Um, five. Yeah, it's amazing. So what's actually doing the work? So in fact, most of the work is done by computers. We are not doing anything unless something goes wrong. 
Okay. And well, of course, the whole experiment is not run all the time by five people. But if you're in the middle of the night, there's one shift leader who organizes everything here in, with the people and makes the decisions. So shift leader is always necessary. We have one person that is setting up the data acquisition and controlling which data components or which detector components are read out for their new information. There's one person that is controlling the trigger. The triggering system means we have so many collisions, we are not taking all these data. If you would take all these data, it would mostly be noise or something that we know already. The trigger is responsible to, to pick out the interesting events. Then we have one person looking into the data quality. And most important, we have one person taking care of detector security. So most part of what you see behind me, all these screens are part of the detector safety system. Also with cameras where you can look into the cavern, what's going on, all kinds of signals coming in and alarms and such. And these five okay. people are normally necessary to do control everything in the middle of the night. Okay, Something very good. Interesting so, uh, happens. We ask experts. Phone calls so, are always possible. May 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 uh, you can you can have uh, may I jump over, uh, take over the picture, please? Of course. Uh, see, uh, so done. Please, yes, because now I'm I'm here at the backside, from in one of our conference rooms, and I go out. Uh, then you see where am I? I'm here. Okay, we lost him. So you're looking at a picture of the, uh, yeah. So looking we were at, just... you were looking at a picture of the nearest ski station to, uh, to see a mess so actually, actually. Outside the building, there is <laughs> yeah. not, not so he, too much reception. Yeah, he so was, that's why. Yeah. He was just looking outside the window of our control out. room and he left the On room. The and unfortunately, so the Michael, connection was Michael, lost. Michael, you are, uh, you are lost uh, and your signal is absolutely bad. Could you please go back to the building? So Zoltan asked Michael to come back because his connection is too bad. It was not foreseen uh, that he goes exactly there he is now. And what yes. we were seeing were the Jura Mountains with one of the skiing stations, in fact, and a lot of snow on the Jura Mountains. So there now I'm out. I'm next. Then I'm next to the to the building still. Hello. I don't see my. Can you see connect? You are there. there. You are there. You are there. Michael, we can hear you and see your camera. Okay, perfect. So this is this is the building uh, where we pre-assembled on the surface the most of the things, and over there there are some dipoles. That, uh, these are real uh, accelerator equipment. And now we go inside the building. Michael, where, Michael, what's a yes, what's a dipole? The dipole is a part of the LHG experiment, which makes the protons, the particles, circle, uh, run in a circle, and then where they cross, they cross the circle in uh, opposite direction. And where they cross, we set it up a big measuring device. And here we, you see, maybe you go over there, then we see the size. So you see, this is, this is CMS, where so we have a spare detector, if you like, on the surface, which is of course not true, this is a, just a life-size picture. This is one of our pictures of CMS in this in the real uh, dimension here in the assembly hall. And in the very center, over there, the, the beam pipe goes right of the detector. I will show you downstairs on the real experiment as well. Uh, and there they cross the two beams cross and they collide. And in collision transforms energy into, into matter and all the particles which are created in the collisions then traverse all these other subdetectors around and, uh, and give us the product we, we want. I show you, I make a, a 360 degree circle and you see in here on the surface hole, this was the area where we created uh, pre-assembled 11 of these huge uh, divide, uh, huge elements, huge disks in this size. And then we, we shifted them over the big, uh, the, the shaft over the plug. And you see below, Michael. Uh, Michael. 
Yes. Okay. Are Mickey, there? Mickey yes, are you are you on Wi-Fi? Uh, should... I'm. Am I? Am I on Wi-Fi? You should be on Wi-Fi and 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 yes, phone. No, I, I know. I am on both. Should should be. So it's what you what you connection. see? Yes. So one moment, I get an extension so I can show you a little bit more. No, 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 of course not. It's just is, before the shaft. Where is, our what he's trying to show you is the down. hole. There's a big hole. Exactly. <laughs> big 15 diameter, meter yeah. diameter hole so, down which the, the experiment was lowered in big chunks, big si uh, slices. And the uh, with a few centimeters uh, yeah. excess dimension yeah. at each side. So yeah, this, this, this was done. Was this was done yeah. by a huge, uh, by by a huge crane, and very 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 slowly. Extremely so what you see, slowly. And what, you see, what, what you see here? This is the picture, and this is the shaft here, and this here is a beton block, which is then when we operate, we close the shaft, and then. Uh, this is 800 uh, ton beton block uh, where the discs were put on top then it was slided back and and the and the things were lowered okay beton is so, concrete the, the yes. largest piece was 2000 tons it was lowered i think it was 2006 12 hours like mix set took a long time and it was filmed live by bbc at that time and uh, the crane that was used, there are only very few of them in the world, was later on used to put on the roof on the Durban football arena for the championship. So um, maybe, uh, Sultan, can you always keep, uh, can you uh, uh, adjust it such that just my picture is on as long as I'm... Uh, everybody sees your picture, Mika, everybody sees okay. your picture, believe me, okay? Good. So uh, what do you I have keep, here? I keep Klaus on because uh, you, you come and go. As soon okay, as good. you are downstairs, you will be the only person. OK, good. So this is this uh, piece, which looks like uh, Star Wars, is actually one old accelerator piece of the large electron and positron collider, uh, where, the, where this is the beam pipe in there. And this is an accelerator element. So you have in the accelerator, um, you have magnets who deviate the particle on electric field elements who accelerate the particles. So now I will go over to the shaft with a lift to go down, down downstairs. Okay, so okay, I think the, what... the LHC tunnel uh, is, is, is an interesting tunnel because it actually existed before the LHC was built. It was built to house another particle ac accelerator collider called the Large Electron Positron Collider. And that was through the 90s. And when that had uh, done its research, it was completely decommissioned. Oh. Everything was taken out and uh, the tunnel was completely <laughs> empty. And they started to install the Large Hadron Collider. Now, this was at the end of the 90s. And it took a further eight years before the Large Hadron Collider was ready to go. They switched it on and it switched itself off again immediately. Uh, it broke, but it was fixed and it's been running ever since, apart from maintenance and upgrades. Today we're in an upgrade phase and maybe we can tell you what that is, what we're doing today, but we won't do that now because Michael is, is uh, Getting close to the famous lift, where he's going to go down in his lift. Here he goes. So, he gets the lift. How far are you going, Michael? So I'm going to the third, uh, to the second floor. It comes up from the uh, third floor because we have three floors downstairs. And about minus um, hundred meters. It's almost the ground floor of the experiment. The third floor is almost 100 meters, so 98 meter. And then, of course, under, under you have still other caverns below the experiment, cable shafts connecting the science 
uh, detectors um, with the, um, the uh, electronic and the computers in the electronic cavern. You will see, you, um, I, we, we go, we have, I will show you uh, the, there are two caverns downstairs, the electronic and the service cavern and the, experiment and the experimental cavern. cavern. I, will, I, will, I, will I will start in minus one where we, uh, we have a, a mock-up uh, in, in the experimental cavern. So, so you're here, at zero meters at the moment. That's yes, good. Right. Zero, uh, meters. zero meters and we, we go downstairs. Yeah, now. Off we go. Let's hope it moves. Yeah. Yes, it's here we moving. Go. Here there we go. Yeah, and that's what happened usually whenever somebody is going with the elevator, the connection is lost and they will gain it back again when they are downstairs. So here we are at CMS, it's 100 meters below. Um, the whole accelerator is flat underground, but the surface of course is tilted. It's going down from the Jura mountains about 1,800 meters down to Lake Geneva at about 500 meters. So that means that the four large experiments are different depth. So CMS is 100. Uh, Alice is the deepest one. I think Mick can tell more about it. Man, no, 60 no. by. Alice is very shallow. That's only it, 70 ah, meters. Ah, no, it's, yeah, the okay. Aleph was the, the, was the, the deepest, deepest okay. 140. And the, the shallowest is Delphi 60, right? Uh, X Delphi, no, the, now LHCB. X Delphi was, 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 I think, more than 100. Uh, as well, the the reason for that is that the so one thing is that the LHC is tilted. Yeah, but not much. Not much, only, but the but the terrain above, bit. but the terrain above is uneven. Yeah, that's and what it, I explained. It runs up very steeply. So indeed, the highest point of the LHC above sea level is somewhere around between here and the the X Aleph. Uh, however, these are the most of the the, the Aleph is the deepest. Place. Okay, I'm uh, uh, listen. Ah, okay, uh, so I'm, I'm downstairs. Okay, Michael okay. is back. <laughs> yes. So we could cover uh, yeah. the little break. And so he just I, left the elevator. Yeah. So, so I, I can. I can. Do you see my picture again? Yes. Yes. So you, you see. You see. Then you see where I come from. I came from from the top. This is the lift shaft. And a little shaft also for a crane to lower smaller equipment. I showed you before the big, uh, the big shaft. And here, this is a, 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 a plexiglass mock-up of the underground caverns. So uh, what you have down here, this, so this is a tunnel, LHC tunnel, entering this, the experimental cavern where we go in a, in a minute over there, we see a mess in the center where the, uh, the beam is crossing and creates a, uh, the collisions. And where we are now is in this shaft here, in this experimental cavern, where all the electronic equipment, the computers are in installed. Why do we have two shafts? This is uh, fast, easy to, ex to explain, because in here, when we have created coll collisions, we have very harsh radiation environment. Nobody is allowed during the collision and physics run to be in this cavern. So whenever something breaks, you want to exchange the computer fast. This one is, is, is easily is easy uh, accessible. So we can always access, uh, even if there's the, the collisions are, are taking place in this cavern. And the second uh, reason is we have, as you may have already uh, 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 known, that we use very strong magnetic field to deviate the particles. So we have very strong magnetic field and harsh radiation environment, not very good for electronic, and also not for safety for the people. That's why whatever is not needed very close to the, to the collision point, <clears throat> we all shift in the <clears throat> service cavern. And we have between the detectors here in the, in the experiment and the computer and the readout electronic in the, in the service cavern, they're around in the mean, the 120 meter of cable, okay? So, and now we, we go, through here to the end of, of one side, through the electronic rocks and enter into in the main experimental cavern. I will go now through and you will see all the electronic wrecks. And there are two floors 
on top. Uh, there's another floor, uh, one floor below. Hello, Michael. Are you there? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, Michael, what are these uh, electronic racks doing? The electronic racks. I mean, I, I will. I will go uh, uh, one floor. But it's not there because. Okay. So I see we have one question that is, is that for data storage as well? Uh, no, the the data. Is, no, it's not for data storage. All the data that were taken are sent upwards to the control room where I am. Uh, below, above me, we have a little computer center where there's a first treatment of all these data. And then the final data storage is at the CERN main site. So it's not stored here. Yes. So what you have here in this area, uh, in the, in the, in the, <laughs> yeah, okay. In this, in the service cavern, you have uh, it, what something which is called trigger. Uh, Mick can explain you what is the trigger. Yeah, okay. So the the computing and the electronics that we've we're sort of looking at, okay. Uh, actually, what the first thing that CMS does. Um, I usually, if I'm taking students there, I say, listen very carefully, because if it's running and you'll hear, no, 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 maybe. And what does that mean? It means that the computing, the electronics are saying this interaction, this particle interaction is actually not interesting. We are not going to record this because we've seen this type of interaction before. Okay, so it just says reset everything and you can have a have a look at another one. Now, what is the reduction factor? Well, this this uh, is varying with time, but let's say 40 million collisions at CMS per second maybe get reduced to uh, a thousand per second. So there's a huge reduction factor. And that implies that you sort of have to know what you're looking for. So uh, let me quickly tell you what you see here on my screen right now. So uh, you have the electronic boards as and which decides, process the data coming directly and decides which uh, detector which uh, event we want to use and which one we just uh, trash. And uh, if you see clo closely, the data I'm going is trans to transferred via uh, fibers. So you have always glass fiber cable, glass fiber fibers uh, for, for the data. And whatever is copper is for slow control and for power. One other safe, this is here now a safety aspect because we are connected with all these rigs, wherever is current and power, it's very dangerous if these guns get on, out, out of control, if there's a fire. So what the first fire safety and water safety we installed in inside, and this would flush with CO2, the rigs, and, uh, and, 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 and kill the, uh, the fire inside. So here, this is all, these are all uh, uh, signals, signal cables. And over here, what you see here, these are power. These are, these, these, we have all the way from, at the other side of this uh, service cavern, we have also, we have a full uh, line of power. Uh, um, Michael, I think it was important for you to move along because we've yes. got, 20 minutes left and we're not at yes. the experimental so, cavern. Okay, this, this, for example, this whole rack here is, uh, is just the muon chambers powering. So let's go down, let's go now. Oh, I'm one. going down to, towards. Towards the experiment. The height yeah. of uh, the beam pipe. What you see here is uh, the entrance to the LHC tunnel because uh, we are now here at, at this side. 
where since the experiment, experiment the, the, P, the LHC goes through and you can walk around the LH, all the LHC, what you cannot, you cannot jump over the experiment. So in each experiment, you have a bypass for, for the people and transport. And this is the entrance in the bypass tunnel. And now, and this is actually, does, can somebody uh, step into the LHC tunnel, please? Yes. This, mock -up this is the LHC, this is a mock-up picture, yes. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> since we cannot go in there. So this let's go in. Size. So Michael, while you're going yes. through the barrier, we have one question and that is, is artificial intelligence involved in processing the data? And the answer is yeah. yes, Sorry. we are using okay. artificial intelligence. Oh, take it. It's good. Thank you. We are not we are not using it immediately down there in the cavern, but in the computer centers. So essentially you can consider one of the events as a complicated picture with about 50 million pixels. And out of these 50 million pixels, we would like to extract right. interesting information and separate all the events in different categories. And that is partially done using artificial intelligence. So, it might, are you it ready might, again? Wait a minute, Michael. Just let's say it might have looked easy for you to get in there, but of course it's not. Okay, it's not easy. Michael had to have his yes. eyes red, and if this device did not recognize him, he wouldn't get in. In fact, when I have students, I say, if they don't recognize your eyes, the, the person who's the guide, the floor yes. opens and they fall into a, hip, uh, a pit of crocodiles, okay? <laughs> yes. uh, if you read the book, Angels and Demons, you will know more about this, but th this is a very sophisticated eye scanner plus, okay? Yeah. And you cannot get in, basically, unless it recognizes your eyes. So now go and look at the experimental cavern. So ladies and gentlemen, this behind the door- Is a work of art. CMS. So here, now we're entering via the visitor platform and what you see here, this is CMS. And you're at the level of the beam, the yes. LHC beam the, here. So with the le uh, level of the LHC beam pipe, you see right now my colleagues in the very center of the experiment, they, pre they prepare the insertion of the beam pipe because we took it out for the service, because this is a very fragile element. And we are serving, we were servicing all the elements around and you do not want to drop anything or touch it because it has to withstand an enormous pre under pressure. So what do you... So just confirm, Michael, those are people there working inside the center of CMS, yes? Yes. So inside, so this is, Let's, I walk, I walk a, a, a little bit around, let me, and you see my colleagues at the very center. And then if I immediately uh, shift up, there you see the shaft where, where we, uh, I showed you before on the hole, this is over there where yeah, there you can even see this, the life-size picture, which is next to the shaft. And in this, there we lowered 11 of these, of these huge of these huge uh, elements. Discs, if so you like. The discs, these are muon discs. And if you look closely, you see on the on this side, oops, you see the distance between this 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 part is, is a part of the disc of this one, and this was lowered, and you see somehow the clearance between the uh, the shaft uh, boundary and uh, the detector element. So you see it as well here. It just fits in. You have ten left and right. 10 centimeter clearance for this huge um, uh, and, and delicate uh, device. So what you see right now, um, you see this is the same image 
well, you see on our uh, CMS life-size picture on the, on the top. So what you see here is the very, where my colleagues are, at the very center, there's a tracker. So very high resolution silicon tracker. And around the tracker, you have uh, energy measuring devices, the electromagnetic calorimeter and the hadronic calorimeter. These are measuring devices for two different types of families of particles who get stuck there and we measure the energy. And then this one, this here, this is a very, very important device because this is our magnet. This magnet is 13 meter long and seven meter in diameter. And this right now, the strongest and, and largest magnet worldwide. And it's creating almost four Tesla of magnetic field in the center. It, has, it uses the same technology like the LHC dipoles. It's super conductive. Uh, Mick will explain you a little bit later what is su super conductivity uh, when, I, when, I, when I walk down. And My, Michael, let's just, let, yes. let's just summarize what, what you're saying here so that people can really understand so I, what's going on. The first job that CMS does is say, is this interaction interesting or is it not? If it is interesting, it has to measure, it has to measure the properties and identify measure the properties of all the particles and identify them that are produced in the collision. Okay, that's the aim. Now, can it do this? This is an interesting, uh, more sophisticated question and we, we can talk about that later. But it's this 100 megapixel camera, which is made up of sub cameras and they're recording the data saying yes or no and then trying to identify and measure the properties of everything that is produced in the collision. So that's what Michael was talking about when he's saying the tracker, the calorimeters, the muon chambers, etc. Okay. So the big magnet actually is is there, uh, actually, to uh, measure the charge of particles. So, for example, some particles are charged. And in a magnetic field, they will move to the right or to the left, depending on the charge, okay? They will actually move in a circle. And if you measure the radius of the circle, this gives you information about the momentum of the particles. So these are the sort of things, you're taking this data, uh, doing rough calculations, saying yes or no, and then storing the data for more sophisticated analysis when the data is recorded <clears throat> later. Okay, so that's, so that's, now, what, the, that's what it's yeah. doing. So where are you now? You're on so the now bottom I'm, now. Now I'm on the ground floor on the bottom. So Noemi is now on the floor, which is uh, 98 meters, so almost 100 meters below ground. And now I, I look up to the experiment. So there, there you have seen my colleagues working right now. Yeah, it's five o'clock on a, on a Friday afternoon and they're still there. <laughs> so, and now I want to show you something which uh, you may ask why the one side is red and the other one is gold and why is this pizza shape and this is um, some, somehow circle or, or uh, parallel so what we have here is a, a intrinsic structure of the measuring devices inside the detector because we measure in four pi direction so like in this in a, um, uh, in all directions we need to capture the particles it, and so you have in the center, since we don't have a, a, a spheric detector, we have a cylindric and with a detector with plugs they, uh, on, on both sides. So, and we call it at the center uh, the barrel part. So this, this, what you see here are the silver boxes, which are sli slide in the muon chambers. 
in between the red structure. The red structure is important because actually this is iron. It's important to, to first of all, hold the chambers in their place, of course. And secondly, the iron structure is used as return yoke. So the magnet creates um, a, a magnetic field. Uh, is the magnet is a solenoid. That's why CMS is called compact, mo uh, so uh, compact muon solenoid. Muon are one of the important particles we want to measure and they are measured in this uh, outside structure. And solenoid is, is, the, is, is the shape of the magnet. Michael, so, somebody, somebody, Stephanie's asked, um, uh, do these do these slices move together? Yes, this is a this is a very uh, good question because of course these two slices need to fit together because at the end uh, this plug here fits exactly inside with uh, three centimeter clearance up and down into the in, on, into our uh, magnet. Where and brings it close to the tracker, and then you have also here uh, the, a, a layer of electromagnetic color meter, and this is the hadronic color meter. And then there's a muon chambers, like here, the muon chambers are outside. So in the once we run, then all these la all these layers are brought together, as you can see here, very very close shifted together. So this is one of the disc. This is another big uh, muon disc. Then there's a little bit more gap. And this is, this is the, and the other. So uh, in, the, in the operation and physics mode, it's the, the, all the layers of the, all these big discs are, are pushed together, brought together in contact uh, before operation. And then one, one other interesting thing is, um, you push, how do you, how do we move? Because this part here has 1,200 tons. This is one of the end cap, we call it. So end cap is the plug, as I told you, this fits in here and this, the, this surface here is, is in contact with this surface. <clears throat> that we do not lose any, any particles. And how do we move? A 1,200 ton. So let me go below <coughs> our detector. I hope you've got your helmet and your safety shoes on. <laughs> so can I get somebody? Can I get somebody here? Hey, a moment, moment. Just uh, get, get in here, just to show you the, the, the dimension. Okay. I, I guess Michael will still show us the feet. Yeah, I, I, well, let me, let, me, let, me first, let me first show the dimension, yeah. and then I will show you how do we move it. Because if we go down now here, please, uh, turn around, grab it, and lift it up a little bit. <laughs> So we have, as, as you know, as Mick already told you, the CMS collaboration has more than 4,000 people. So we need a, 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 around a two thirds of our collaboration to come down here to lift it up and sh shift it over. <laughs> of course not. So what we do is we use, because this is very delicate, uh, such uh, to move such a huge and heavy uh, and delicate and precise element from one side to the other without, and then, then we keep it in place for very long. So if you use rails, the rails will, will, will get tips and then it's very hard to move them again. So there uh, you have to um, distribute the surface at a big um, surfaces. And then here you see, uh, these are the feet. And uh, how we do it is, is like this, that we use high pressured air. So this is a Hoover graph, if you like. There you see, there you see the high pressured air uh, uh, tubes. And then we, uh, we put high pressured air, we lift it up two millimeters 
and then we pull with the cable and pull it. Okay, Michael, pull it I think Michael, yes. I think we've got that. Um, we've got Harrison who has joined us, and he would like to address us actually with Harrison, but he's having difficulties. Can somebody help Harrison connect so that he can talk to us, please? How does Harrison connect so he can talk? Um, now we should okay. be able to Harrison, talk. Yeah. Oh, okay, here. yes. I yes. guess we can hear you. Uh, good Thank you. You are on air. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you. So maybe you, uh, Harrison, hello. Maybe you hello. want to comment what, you, what we see right now. Um, I just wanted to. I just wanted to be able to speak uh, at any time, but I think uh, you've said uh, what needs to be said. That this is. A, a, I particularly like, for example, Mick's comment that um, this is really a gigantic camera, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's an enormously complicated camera that takes pictures in three dimensions, and what one has to remember is that not only is this a three-dimensional camera is a camera that has to, in principle, decide which of the one billion potential pictures per second it wants to actually uh, send off and uh, store. And, and that is uh, in, in itself an extraordinary um, task. And one that I presume we'll talk about a little bit uh, later. Okay. Uh, okay, you, Michael. We. We've got yes. to, I don't know how much time the, the guys have in Florida here, but it's, uh, we've been going for, well, we haven't been going for an hour, but we are at the, the time when we would have been going for an hour. So I think we have to, we have to start thinking about how we yes. Yes. Uh, let, let's give me, give me Yes, give me, give me five more minutes. I will run around once more uh, <laughs> to give you a, a different view because I just went to the other side and as you can see, the elements, the detector elements look exactly the same. So they are very symmetric. Here. Harrison, maybe I can ask you a question. How long did it take to build this? Well, the, the, I think that the first proposal for I'll, I'll go to the third floor the CMS was in 19 if I remember correctly what? 1983 hmm. and and so it and as you recall uh we actually started taking um uh data I think it was in 2000 was it 2009 something like this so uh, 83 to 2009 before the machine this detector was actually in a position to uh to take data so quite I mean there are people who basically spend almost an entire scientific career putting this thing together. And roughly speaking, how many people were involved in this major enterprise then? Well, um, the, the actual building of the detector, um, probably about 2,000 people uh, in various ways, because not only, of course, does one have to build the actual machine, but there's an enormous task also to build the software that actually is able to take these data and do something with them. And that too was a major, major task. And in fact, uh, it, it, so a little bit of history, in 2004, the collaboration made an enormously uh, bold decision, which was it decided that some things that we had been building for quite a while was just not workable. And so in 2000, December 2004, we decided to basically scrap uh, a very important piece of software and start from scratch. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, so it, it's both the software as well as the, as the uh, device itself uh, that has been uh, taking an enormous amount of effort and time. Because of course, without the software, this thing is completely and utterly useless. Okay, so what, what, we, can, what we can say is that uh, in building a device like this, um, a lot of the technology uh, that uh, is used to do the job today actually didn't exist back in 1983. So you not only have to think about what you want to do 
uh, and how you're going to do it, but you have to invent things that will allow you to do it. So these are technological developments. Now, these technological developments actually become available for other uses outside of particle physics, because one of the very important things to know about particle or about CERN and about CMS is that everything that is done in the context of particle physics is actually made available <clears throat> to everybody, to humanity. So there's a very interesting question I would like to ask uh, Harrison um, um, and complement it by a, a different remark, which is that the technology that, we, that are, has been invented actually becomes available for use outside of particle physics relatively quickly. We can give you examples of that. Example like the World Wide Web, touchscreen on your phone, uh, imaging in medical applications of particle physics, and also hadron therapy. All of this technology has been invented in the context of particle physics. So you can, you can see there is something useful coming out. Now, the interesting, uh, question, the interesting question, let me just ask Harrison the question. What about the actual uh, fundamental science that we're trying to do? Is there anything interesting that comes out of that? Is this useful to people in, the, you know, in normal life? This is a very good question. And the way I'd like to answer it is by a little bit of history. Uh, so in 1915, uh, Einstein published an amazing paper uh, that described his theory of gravity. One of the conclusions that he arrived at, which he found really quite startling, is, is the idea later on this was referred to as black holes. Now, he also predicted that, you know, from this theory that, uh, there, that there's a distortion of time and space around, for example, a planet. <clears throat> Fast forward to today, every single smartphone on the planet now is able to tell you where you are within a matter of a meter or so. What is extraordinary is that the, is that the physics, the science that underlies the GPS, the global positioning what? system, relies on exactly the same mathematics uh, that describes black holes. Is the other one open? And so what I, what I like to tell people is that right now, the honest answer is I have no idea uh, in what way what we have discovered at CERN uh, will be used a uh, hundred years hence. But if you look at, at history, uh, there's always gonna be someone smart enough later who will think, aha, yes, I can use it for this purpose. Uh, that's, that's one answer. The other answer is that is that we also produce uh, young people. So right now, for example, in the CMS collaboration, about a thousand graduate students, only about 20% of these students will actually stay in particle physics. So 800 of these young people will go out into the rest of the world with extraordinary skills that they can deploy everywhere. And, and they do. And so in addition to the actual science, we also provide Hello, it's fine. extremely well, well trained and uh, have skills that are very valuable in every single aspect of life. Okay, uh, Michael, where are you now? So now I, I've doing? been, before I've been on the top floor, may, you may have seen right, right below, right below uh, the crane. I, I look down from the, from the top and now I'm again at the, at the other side of CMS uh, at the, uh, on the height of the uh, uh, beam pipe. And one thing what you see very clear here, because we, we didn't mention, we mentioned how we move this right piece of 1,200 tons to fit in here in this vac tank, vac a vacuum tank, because vacuum, why? Because as I told you, the, uh, the magnet is super conductive and needs uh, to be uh, cooled down to uh, two Kelvin. So my almost my minus 300 degree Celsius. And of course, we do not, when we move the whole thing, we do not disconnect all these thousands and thousands of, of uh, electronic equipment. So we leave it connected. And what you see on the other side, this is the, um, rot rot the flexible uh, cable tray. So when this moves, the, all the cables long, uh, go along 
with and we do not have to and, and there's another one and there are others underneath these metal bars there are the other uh, cables which just will stay connected while we move this thing so now okay, I, michael I will, michael Michael, we've gone over time now, so I think it might be a good idea to ask the guys who are watching if they have any if, yes. if they have any open questions that they would like to ask us. Okay. Yes, I would. Just from what I would, you've I seen would, us. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say I walk like from here to the other side. Here, they see uh, one more the, the view around, and while while we do, I do this, please ask questions. Yeah, Stephanie said that she was very uh, pleased to see that there is no such thing as a, <laughs> a particle detector uh, uh, experiment designer, or is not an occupation that you can sign up to be. Uh, there are actually detector builders and detector designers, but um, yeah. The occupation particle de particle detector builder is uh, is, is fi fairly rare in life. Yeah. What do you what do, what actually do you do, Harrison? Are you a particle detector designer or are you? A... So I, I of course way back in my youth uh, I, I helped to build you know both uh, both design build, install <laughs> detectors. But of course, uh, in, in, in more recent years, I, I've, I would consider myself to be mostly the sort of physicist who looks at the data and tries to see whether there's anything in it that's interesting. Um, so I, what, what I think is important to realize is that, which is actually remarkable when you think about it, that uh, every single part of this device has been built um, in many different places around the world. And there are specialists, of course, in, in detectors that track particles. There are specialists in detectors that measure the energy of particles. There are specialists in, in, in the um, electronics that's used to get these data out of these devices and so on. And so there's a very wide range of people with different skills. But one shout out I want to really make is that um, today, we would be absolutely dead in the water without the extraordinary talents of uh, engineers and technicians. I mean, th these are really the people who, who make things actually work and come together. The physicists might have an idea, might design something, but in the end, it's the engineer who actually tells us, oh, no, no, this doesn't work. Uh, you've got taken account this stresses. This will simply collapse. They're the ones who actually makes things come together, working closely with the physicists. And, and we shouldn't forget that. And, and, and it is very important. Um, for example, there, there's someone who had to actually work out all of the pathways of the cables from the devices to the control room. Uh, this is actually a real skill because you have to make sure that you know exactly how long each cable is so that you can make sure all the timing is correct. And this is the, so we rely very heavily on, on, on uh, people with those kinds of skills. So even though the physicist uh, may be the person who has the initial idea about what kind of device we want to build, uh, there is no way today that we could do so without uh, a, a, an army of people behind us. Harrison, uh, somebody, Alex, is asking what are some of the most interesting recent pieces of data? That's how Alex puts it. Yeah, um, I, this is this is a very a very good question. One of the most interesting uh, recent developments is that so just just if I, this gives me a chance to talk a little bit of physics. So one of the predictions that came out of the theory from the 1960s is that the Higgs boson, this uh, particle that that was discovered in 2012, uh, can break apart in different ways, and the theory predicts exactly how often that happens and, and all the different ways in which this happens. And one of the most interesting recent pieces of data is that we have, we have actually confirmed to some level of accuracy that this prediction is actually correct. That for example, that the Higgs boson breaks apart into a top and an anti-top quark far more, more readily than for example, into, into electrons. And, uh, and so what, was once upon a time an abstract prediction that uh, was not necessarily widely 
widely accepted has now been confirmed. And to me, this is extraordinary. It's also disappointing, <laughs> to be honest, because we are absolutely desperate, desperate to find evidence, data that disagrees with this amazing theory called the standard model, because it's disagreement with uh, what we expect that will allow us to make progress. And so it might seem strange, but this is really what we're hoping for. We're hoping that something, we discover something that actually does not agree with what we expect. But that's for me yeah. the most interesting uh, recent piece of data. What about the things that people might have heard of? People might have heard of things like antimatter. They may have read the famous book. They may have read about dark matter. These maybe are concepts that are more easily understandable than the standard model. Right. Is, C is CMS going to, has it, or is it going to shed any light on dark matter, if that's one way yeah. that we can... So one thing, uh, if ever you get a chance to actually visit, so you'll be able to actually go and visit a factory, right, that makes antimatter, the antimatter factory. Um, one of the, actually one of the most uh, intriguing questions for which we do not have an answer is... Maybe, can you go there? Just do it on the side. Is, is, is why, if, if you, let's suppose you make a guess, and you say that when the universe began, there surely must have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter, right? Because, you know, positive, negative, you add them together, you get zero. And that's the hypothesis that we all make, that there must have been equal amounts of each. However, if you look at the universe as we see it, uh, there are only trace amounts of antimatter, literally, really trace amounts, very, very little. And so the obvious question is, what has happened to all the antimatter. Uh, we, we don't have an answer to that. However, uh, it may well be that uh, some of the ideas that people have proposed, such as, you know, for example, dark matter, at first, at first sight, you might think, well, well, what does that have to do with antimatter? Well, uh, it could well be that if we actually are able to produce this dark matter at CERN, we don't know whether we can, but if we were able to do so, there, is, there are reasons to believe that the existence of dark matter would have some bearing on what happened to the antimatter in the universe. Unfortunately, uh, we have not seen any sign of dark matter, which is really unfortunate because when we look out into the sky, there is lots of, um, indirect evidence that the vast amount of matter in the universe is actually of a form that we cannot actually see, right? so-called dark matter. So we think it exists, and we would like to imagine that this uh, device that we are looking at and, and the accelerator is powerful enough to actually make it. But so far, we've not been able to make it. Okay, Stephanie made an interesting remark. Uh, Stephanie says, so contradiction, yeah, well, it's gone off the screen now. It's contradiction is as important as confirmation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. because it went off the screen because I just answered, answered it I... saying that confirming something expected like the Higgs boson is great, but finding something that contradicts our expectation means we find something new. Exactly. And that is even more exciting. Absolutely. <laughs> And, and, and that's the thing that we are looking for. We're looking for a contradiction, something that, that is unexpected. And, and it, it is remarkable that this theory that was uh, written down in the 60s and early 1970s um, still rules supreme. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's remarkable. And we should both celebrate this, right? I, I think we should celebrate the fact that, uh, you know, we're a species among which there are a few people who are sufficiently creative to, pre to create these theories that are remarkably predictive and explain so much. But right now, the, the, the real motivation for the experiments that are being done at the LHC is to find contradictions, things that do not agree mm. with what we expect. 
And you might say, Please. why? Because we want to understand things that, we, that, that, that are clearly puzzles, such as, you know, what, what, if, if, if our interpretation of what we see out in the universe is correct, we would like to un understand. Uh, I mean, I personally would like to understand is the dark matter that we infer from space, first of all, is it actually matter? Right? We, we all assume that because we're particle physicists and we're all, we all like particles. And so we assume because we have a certain prejudices that the thing that we label dark matter is actually matter. So that's a question I would like to have answered. You know, is, it, is it stuff or, or something else? But we have yet uh, to find a definitive answer one way or the other. Maybe, maybe, maybe uh, can I shortly interrupt for a moment? Please go ahead. I think we are already in the discussion session, so I would say I, I'll go up and uh, we say goodbye to the experiment itself and, okay. and to the team. Yeah, yeah thanks so. very much for showing us it, Michael. Yeah, Where yeah, are you? Thank you for having me. This was really, really great. And, um, and also the team. Of, uh, of your colleagues, uh, without whom you know this could not happen. So thank you very much indeed. This is really appreciated. Okay, great. Thanks. So uh, I'll please continue. I'll, I'll I'll just go up. Okay. On the on the upper floor. Harrison, does uh, somebody's asking? I I think this does the CMS or Atlas have any chance of actually uh, finding out what dark matter actually is? Do you have a strategy for? Uh, trying to discover what it is? Yes, so uh, of, of course, uh, we, 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 have, we have, you know, strategies and, and, and so on. But, but of course, one of the problems that we, that we have is, is that we don't, we're looking for something whose properties we don't, we can infer from space. And, and if we take what we infer from space at face value, then, then it would appear that these should be particles whose, whose mass should be within the range of, uh, of the LHC, by which I mean we should be able to create them. On the other hand, if we follow our prejudices, uh, these particles will be ones that we cannot actually directly detect. They will escape from the detector, right? Um, they cannot be charged particles because if that were the case, then we would see them, they, they would interact with light. And so we have a way to look for things that we can't detect directly by asking the question, if we add up all the particles that we can see and we find that the, there appears to be um, um, you know, a, a, a lack of, of conservation of energy or momentum, we then will say that, that if we believe, and there's every, every, lots of evidence that you know, energy and momentum are in fact conserved things. If we find that there's a discrepancy in the momentum, we will attribute that to something having escaped from the detector. Unfortunately, there are other things that can escape from the detector like neutrinos. And so it, it is not so easy because you have to convince yourself that you know uh, how to distinguish between whether or not the missing momentum is due to just neutrinos or due to something new. Um, so it is. It is. Um, so we have ways, but we are still also looking for um, more cleverness from our young people about how to actually go about looking for something. You know, how do you look for something when you don't know what it is that you're looking for? That's the that's the question. So, in fact, in summary, we have this. You have this incredibly detailed standard model, which you can make predictions and you make measurements, which agree with the standard model. But there are two of the the biggest predictions of, uh, of our cosmological model, the existence of antimatter and dark matter that we can't answer. Is that correct? Answer. That's right. And, and, and it's, it's really, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm both, I, I say I'm both, you know, in awe as well as disappointed because I'm in awe that there is this theory called kind of model that works so well. I mean, it, it, it is extraordinary. Why should it? But it does. Harrison? Yes. We also have the question, did we find any disagreements while you were talking about the standard model? 
And I also would like to give you the question whether we are using time crystals. <laughs> <laughs> so th there are always disagreements, right? We always find discrepancies, but these discrepancies tend to be ones that uh, are not sufficiently large to basically make any definitive statement one way or another, right? They're, they're always, we call them anomalies. Um, and, and if we look at, at the past, what we have often found is that it's, at least so far, these anomalies disappear when we actually have a better understanding. For example, we may have a better understanding of the detectors. We may discover that there's something that we, that we missed when doing an analysis. So I would say right now, uh, yes, there are discrepancies, but none of them are at a level that one would be inclined to say that we found something new, right? Um, now, you mentioned uh, uh, time crystals. Yeah, yes. so, so to tell you, so the question is, um, somebody is reading a lot about time crystals lately, so is there any relation to temporal materials in our experiments? That is the precise question. To, to temporal materials, so this is not something... I could answer. I mean, I, I so if I if so, you have to remind me a little bit about time crystals. I mean, the, the this is a relatively new new idea, right? That theorists have been have been uh, talking about. Is that is, is this? Could you just just to jog my memory? Could you could you say a little bit about time crystals? Well, that's a question we have for very uh, via question and answer, so it's not my question, so I can't yeah, tell okay, you more yeah. about it. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, so I, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not so familiar with, with this. Uh, I've heard the term, but I'm not, I, and I don't. The the fact that we, there's been no discussion about such things within the collaboration suggests to me that this is something that is probably more related to another field uh, than ours. I would say it's more related to something like quantum computing. I think and, yeah. and this is something we are not doing right now in our experiment. Right. That, that's, that's my impression uh, from, from, uh, from this. So I do not know very much about it at all. Um, maybe, maybe I can, can I comment uh, the last pictures because now I already arrived on the, on the uh, floor up, upstairs on the uh, outside on the ground floor already. Uh, and what you see back there is an installation um, of the collaboration, symbolizes the collaboration. Uh, you can read CMS, but if you look closer to the, to the pixels, you will see our colleagues, and use, uh, which is also symbolizing the diversity of our collaboration and, the, and the, with different characters, different age. And what you see here is an installation which symbolizes, uh, these are watches. And you, if you count the watch, there are one, one watch missing uh, to capture all uh, time zones CMS uh, has institutes. So we are a collaboration in more than 50 different countries um, with more than 200 uh, different university institutes. So it's a huge, it's not just a technological or scientific challenge, it's also um, a huge uh, social challenge actually. Uh, uh, and the best, the best person uh, uh, to talk to about the social challenge is actually <laughs> Harrison because he's right now uh, the collaboration chair, which meaning, um, guiding uh, and, uh, and cheering uh, this huge collaboration of more than 3,000, almost 4,000 people. So I, I, go, I go back to the control room now. So I'm conscious that we've been going for about an hour and a half now, and uh, I'm not sure how much time we, we have left, maybe... Uh, Stephanie can tell us, or you can, uh, if there are some more questions, we are happy to keep going, but uh, I'm conscious that time. Stephanie, mm -hmm. we will make her talk. Uh, <clears throat> so we just give the microphone to Stephanie, if I understood correctly. Yes. Yeah. Hold on. 
Oh, she is. She's okay. She needs, she needs to unmute and then you can talk, please. Okay. Hi. <clears throat> I'll start my video. Just hang on a sec. Okay. So um, I don't know how many of us are here. There's 14 people, so that's pretty good. Um, I suppose we want to say, say a big thank you because that was pretty amazing. Um, you know, you see pictures of it, but I did feel like I was going through we'll have, we'll have this one. Um, food for thought. You're, you're right. Really, you know, I'd love to be there. I'm sure most of us would, and I'm sure we have lots of questions, but I know that we have to, at some point now, kind of uh, update the artists on, on what we're planning due to the extended situation that we're in. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for that, Michael and Mick, and I've forgotten all your names, CMS Control Room. <laughs> Klaus, Klaus, in fact. Klaus, yeah. Klaus. 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 Mm -hmm. Klaus Solta, Noemi, and a new group, a new yeah. yeah. Yes, thank you very much indeed. This is really. Well, you're uh, very welcome. Mm -hmm. And of course, we would be happy to have you here in person. It's mm. just, just some nasty virus that's preventing it. Yes, it's very <laughs> annoying. Um, okay, so what should we do now, Harrison? Should we use this 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 Zoom link to update, or should we? Um, I, I think it's a bit difficult to move back now. Yeah, I, I, I think we should just uh, update with the Zoom link. Okay. Um, I think that's the easiest. Should we? Uh, just one question. Should we uh, keep on the recording because we're recording it? No, no we, we can now stop. Uh, can we can record stop the recording? Okay, good. Then yeah. we stop the visit uh, recording now, and we have a.